everyone. Good morning to the five speakers or four speakers who are already here. There'll be more coming, I hope. Good morning to the remainder of the world. I, I know you're all listening. I can see the numbers here on the screen. I know how many people are listening, and there's a lot of you guys. That's great. Um, and so every, I mean, every Tropentag starts with a Tropen morning. Yeah, so this is the morning of the Tropentag. It's usually kind of the hangover period, not this time because the parties didn't happen last night or everybody had them on their own. But it seems like all the speakers who made it here look very fresh and motivated to give us a, a great session on, what was it called again? Uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. We have a well, a pretty colorful mix of, of topics here. So as usual, the poster sessions will be a wild ride throughout the, the tropics and, and, and other parts of the world. And I would propose that we get started. We have uh, 45 minutes, we have um, nine presentations. Um, so each, um, each I think all, everybody has recorded a video ahead of time. So we'll be watching these videos, they're between three and five minutes long. And so after each one, we should have a bit of time for questions. Uh, questions, especially to the audience out there, the questions cannot be asked in the YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube, but they have to be entered in the uh, WUFA app. app yeah? So if you want to ask a question, please go there and let us let us know, type the, type the message there. I hope, hope everybody can find it. Um, yeah, so I'll be, I'll be watching, I'll be monitoring closely what questions come in. Um, the speakers will be happy for to answer everything that I, well, all questions that you may want to ask. If you don't, then I'll be asking the really tough questions. So don't do that to the speakers. Um, ask easy questions or ask questions that are interesting and uh, can uh, get us into a bit of a discussion. Um, so I think with that, I don't want to, this is not my, I'm not the presenter here, so I don't want to waste everyone's time. And I would propose that we jump right into the, um, the first presentation. So we'll be watching a video by Macarena San Martin Ruiz. So the Macarena video, I think we've all seen that before. <laughs> no, um, this will be on, on recycling of coffee byproducts by composting regarding climate relevant emissions and products. And um, I would ask the um, our technical team or a large technical team to start the first video for us. Well, please, are you there? My name is Macarena San Martin from University of Stuttgart, and today I'm going to present the San Martin. <laughs> you share the share the screen. Yeah, okay, getting there. From University of Stuttgart, and today I'm going to present the topic of recycling of coffee by products by composting regarding climate relevant emissions and products. The coffee sector in Costa Rica has itself the goal of a sustainable management of coffee by products incorporating climate change adaptation measures into its practices. Therefore, emissions play an important role in future assessments options for climate change mitigations. Coffee pulp is the organic waste generated from the wet processing of the fruit, which can become, if not properly managed, a highly polluting waste generating odor, larvae, flies and greenhouse gas emissions such as methane. The mill of a study generates about 37,000 tons per year of coffee by products per harvest, where more than the 60% of the pulp is being composted without the addition of any extra material and the rest is going to fill the position without prior treatment. Therefore, the main objective is to enhance the opportunity of an improved compost production and at the same time advance to a circular economy in the coffee industry. For the methodology proposed, 530 tons of coffee pulp and 110 tons of green waste were composed for a period of eight weeks. During that period, a weekly monitoring of their methane emissions with chambers and key parameters for composting, such as moisture, pH, and daily temperature, were measured. For this, five different treatments were implemented, where TB is the current treatment of the meal, which corresponds to 100% pulp, therefore was taken as a control for the study. Moreover, five different treatments were mixed with green waste at different percentages in order to determine the behavior of them during the process and their methane emissions. One interesting feature of the pulp is that it contained 85% of water content at the beginning. That's why, in the following graph, it is shown that the water content of the control remained above the normal parameter of composting for five weeks. And if we look on the table one, after the process of the composting is finished, 
the control remain as a fresh compost and the proposed treatment are estimated as finished compost according to the degree of composition or rotting degree parameter. On the other hand, looking on the emissions rate for the treatment, it was found that the pulp mixed with cream waste achieved a reduction in emissions and the control shows a poor aeration and high moisture content enhancing the methane formation, which means that the proposed treatment we are increasing the volume of pore and therefore improves the exchange of water and air. The second graph shows when the pulp is not proper handled, the methane emissions rate could go over a long period of time. This behavior tells that the material is not degraded, producing continuous emissions of great magnitude when it's not proper treated, having emissions rates similar in some genes, for example, during the first and the fifth year. That's why this management is not recommended and the ideal will be the elimination of this practice for future years. To summarize, can be concluded that it's possible to obtain a waste valorization within the process, the coffee pulp is suitable for composting if green waste is added, and the, the reduction of methane emissions, larvae and odor is achieved. For future steps of this research is to calculate emission factors for the coffee sector with the improved treatment, the personnel and meal training, and compost field trials in the coffee plantations. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for this beautiful presentation. <laughs> that, was, that was amazing. I'm going to clap for you, you know, <laughs> everyone you. else is, I'm sure, that you, you just can't hear it. <laughs> uh, it was a very nice presentation. I'm not seeing any questions yet. So audience, audience back home, wherever you may be, please post your questions in the WUFA app, because there's a question and answer forum here that uh, will be our main source of inputs for the discussion. <laughs> Um, still nothing here, despite the large audience on YouTube that, we're, that is following us. So maybe, uh, maybe I'm the only one who has, still has questions, or the, uh, do the other speakers maybe have questions? Mariko. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ziba Barati, a PhD student at Hohenheim um, University. I would have a question. Um, did you also measure other gas emissions, not only methane? Well, this is actually, uh, the project is divided like in three phases. So right now I'm just focusing, since this is just a poster on the emissions part, but we were also measuring nitrous oxide emissions mm -hmm. in the uh, composting and in the coffee plantations, because mm -hmm. the idea at the end is to reduce the nitrous oxide emissions from the coffee plantation. But for that, the idea will be the reduction of the inorganic fertilizers. So that's why we have to start at the beginning from the composting and then to, to reach the coffee plantations at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, I also have a question. So it sounds like a no-brainer. It seems like it's a it's a great idea to to add green, green waste to um, mm -hmm. to the pulp. Why are people not doing it? What could be impediments to adoption? Is it really expensive? Yeah, to it's, it's it's pretty uh, complicated. Like a few years ago, we were together with the Nama Coffee uh, facility in the country, uh, trying to investigate more like about the practices that the, like the farmers were uh, doing with the uh, coffee pulp. But unfortunately, the, they are following what the others are following. Mm, okay. So at the beginning, they were dumping them in the river. Like, of course, the smell, like the people were complaining a lot in the, in the, in the surroundings. And then they found out that it can be composted. So they were just doing it with 100% uh, pulp. Therefore, like the aeration was not enough. And that's why they were having high uh, methane emissions and high odors as well. Okay. And then we were start trying uh, since three years already with this practice and seems like has been helping a lot in the in the population and in the in the composting itself. All right. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> so we had two really insightful answers to uh, our questions. And I think that's all we can afford in this session, I'm afraid, because it's pretty high throughput. And we may have to already thank you. Guys. Well, first of all, thank you very much for preparing this for us and inform us, informing us about this uh, interesting topic. And we move on to the next one, uh, which is going to be Ziba Barati, who is going to talk about um, environmental impact assessment of rice cultivation in Da Nang, Vietnam, options for sustainable production systems. Take it away. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ziba Barati, a PhD student at Hohenheim University. 
This poster is about environmental impact assessment of rice cultivation in Da Nang, Vietnam, to develop options for sustainable production systems. Rice is the main staple food in Vietnam, which occupies the biggest share of the agriculture areas. This also applies to the city of Da Nang, located in the central region of Vietnam. The overuse of inputs in terms of fertilizer, pesticides, and water in the rice production system resulted in environmental problems and also health issues for the population. The main objective of this study was to assess the environmental impact of the traditional rice farming system in Da Nang. The environmental impacts was analyzed following standard methods. Potential scenarios were modeled and evaluated based on the functional unit of 1 kg harvested rice. The environmental impacts of the scenario were evaluated regarding the global warming potential, the primary energy demand, the eutrophication potential, and water consumption. Figure 1 shows system boundaries of the LCA model in this study, and Table 1 shows alternative rice farming scenarios. In Figure 2, we can see the results of LCA for global warming potential, eutrophication potential, primary energy demand, and water consumption for different alternative scenarios. The results of global warming potential showed advantage when applying alternating wetting and drying. Moreover, incorporation of residual resulted in a higher global warming potential in the pairwise comparison with the baseline and the alternating wetting drying scenarios. Furthermore, burning and composting of rice straw resulted in the highest global warming potential. In addition, the eutrophication potential indicated that an incorporation of residual or application of composted straw have positive effect. This also applies for the primary energy demand and the water consumption. Results show complex interlinkage and trade-off in both within and between the chosen impact categories. Applying alternative rice cultivation system can result in a lower global warming potential but causing a higher water consumption, primary energy demand, and eutrophication potential instead. It's highly dependent on the local condition. Therefore, further studies need to clarify local best practice solutions based on site-specific data. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. No, you're very welcome for our attention, we, which was not hard to keep because it was a very interesting presentation and interesting study. Um, I've just been alerted that the Q&A link does not work by our conference chair, which means that we, I can stare at the screen as long as I want and there won't be any questions. I keep staring, maybe they'll come in, but it may maybe just us guys that we have to ask those questions. So, dear speakers, for example, wind ten projects. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was okay. That was a video. Any questions, guys? Otherwise, I'll have to ask one. I will ask one. Um, so, if I if I got you right, you said the drying wetting management practice would be preferable in terms of emissions. Is that just something that scientists cook up or is that realistic under local conditions? Because it's quite a bit harder to manage, right? Than, than all the other measures that you can take. Sorry, uh, could you please repeat your question? Because yeah, I couldn't so hear it well. I believe you, um, you're kind of recommending that the drying wetting practice would be most beneficial in terms of emissions. Is that something that farmers can realistically implement? Because it's pretty difficult to manage, I believe, right? Uh, yes, um, you're completely right. It's the actually a uh, difficult uh, practice. But uh, the aim of this study actually was to uh, evaluate all the um, solutions that which one can reach to the sustainable development of the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found that the, uh, actually the alternative wetting drying system is the good option, but it's also um, results to the higher uh, primary energy demand and also water consumption. 
-hmm. So um, at the end, it's need further um, investigation mm -hmm. to find a better solution for the area. Mm, yeah, sustainability is a pretty complicated animal yeah. if you <laughs> incorporate all of those, all of those things. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, apparently it was clear, very clear to everyone else but me. So thank you very much for your presentation. We move on to the next speaker, who's uh, possibly not here. Amit Kumar Srivastava from the University of Bonn, my favorite university in Germany, does not yeah, seem to be here. Uh, hello, I, I am there, bit, but my computer's name is different and I couldn't manage to change it. Ah, okay. So Win 10 Pro. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, uh, that's Amit, huh? Yeah. Well, in that case, brilliant. Um, let's hear your presentation. You don't have to give it yourself. We'll hear the, listen to the video. Mm. Hello everyone, my name is Amit Shivastu and today I'm presenting on behalf of all my co-authors our model-based simulation results about the existing yield gaps in cassava, which is a tuber crop whose importance as a major food in sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria in particular is well documented. So estimating yield gaps in Nigeria is important firstly because such analysis provides an indicator for prioritizing the most important crops, factors limiting the current productivity and identifying the yield gap hotspots. So given the backdrop, we set the following objectives. First was to evaluate the performance of the lintel 5 crop model for simulating the growth and development of cassava at the field scale as well as the states level in Nigeria. Actually, we carried out this analysis into the 10 states of Nigeria. And second was to identify geospatial gradients of meteorological factors and the effect of climate on yields and yield gaps. So by definition, the yield gap of a crop grown in a certain location and cropping system is the difference between the yield and the optimum management and the average yield achieved by the farmers. So yield under optimum management is labeled as potential yield under irrigated conditions or water limited potential under rain fit conditions. In this study, uh, we used lintel 5 crop model which was calibrated for an early maturing cassava variety called TME 419. Uh, which which was actually from IATA International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Ibadan, Nigeria and we gathered the data at field scale and from the experimental site known as Ikhene which is located in the humid tropical zone of Nigeria. However, in order to run the calibrated model at state's level, we embedded the, the same model into the modeling framework called Simplace, which stands for Scientific Impact Assessment and Modeling Platform for Advanced Crop and Ecosystem Management. The final simulation was run at 1 km spatial re resolution, corresponding to the spatial resolution of the soil input data, which were extracted from the ISRIC soil database. So for each of the simulation units, which were defined as a combination of soil characteristics, climate and crop management data. Here you see the results of the lintel 5 crop model calibration. Here you see the observed and simulated yield agreed well in Ikine. The simulated yield under fertilized and controlled conditions were overestimated by 12.3 and 9.3 percent respectively whereas, whereas the simulated above ground biomass was overestimated by 9% and 1.5% under fertilized and unfertilized conditions respectively. When the same model was applied at 10 states, uh, average simulated yields of these states were in range of observed yields, average which was av ob averaged over 16 years of the data with a root mean square error of 0.5 tons per hectare. Uh, the discrepancy, however, what we saw between observed and the simulated yield could have resulted from variable fertilizer application rates. Actually, we assumed only 16.2 kg per hectare of N all over the states. And also due to the some soil parameters used from the ECDQI's database, which refer to soil samples that may not be the representative of large areas. So available soil data does not likely represent long term cultivated nutrient depleted soil here. Now here comes the our results for the yield gap estimation. Here what you see is the uh, yield gaps in cassava productions are really high and show variability across these traits. The, uh, they are ranging from 6 tons to 9 tons per hectare dry matter whereas the water limited potential yield gap ranges from a minimum of 2.8 
tons per hectare to a maximum of 6.2 tons per hectare dry matter. We also carried out multiple regression analysis which showed that the potential yield correlated spatially with R square of 0.85 as well as temporarily with R square of 0.67 significantly with the radiation. Moreover, the potential yield gap was significantly correlated with the mean temperature with R square of 0 0.90. So the result of the multiple regression out outlined that, that the mean temperature and the radiation are the main limiting factors for the cassava yield under potential conditions. However, yield gaps due to water limitation and the associated spatial and temporal variability wasn't explained by any of the weather parameter that we tested actually in the regression analysis. So in conclusion, what we can see is, is the there was a high yield gaps of cassava in Nigeria and uh, which indicates actually that there is a potential for Nigeria's farmers to increase the yields. Most farmers cultivate cassava on infertile soils and with little or no use of fertilizer. Therefore, proper fertilizer management is needed and if possible and wherever applicable, adding irrigation water would achieve higher yields. Thank you and I'm open to the questions. All right, we are ready to ask questions, right guys? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Amit. Thank you. Do we have any questions in the audience? Seems like the Q&A link still does not work. Other fellow speakers, no questions. I have one that's on my mind, but. Okay, Amit, one, one question to you. So I'm not a huge expert in cassava growth, but usually with most crops in Africa, kind of the main factors that make yields pretty low are biotic factors, right? Like pests, diseases, weeds, and that kind of stuff. You didn't mention them at all. You're kind of saying, oh, well, maybe the waste to yield gap is up less optimized fertilizer management. Do you think that you may be missing something if uh, you use modeling frameworks that sort of exclude all the all the biotic factors yeah you are very right actually because but unfortunately in our simplest framework that we have developed at me has has not the capacity of taking into any of the biotic stresses uh, therefore it's it's one of the <laughs> disadvantages and we still have to uh, go along <laughs> go along to to include these things still we are not able to manage even even the fertilizer management uh, in terms of nutrition, nutrition use efficiency. So we're still developing it. So what yeah. we have carried out in terms of only nitrogen and water stress conditions. Mm, okay. But you are right, it's, it's a huge problem. And mm. yeah, we are still um, far. <laughs> yeah, it always seems like it's that. a in the room when it comes to yeah. modeling, especially in Africa. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, Okay, thank you. It seems it seems the Q and A link does work again. I'm just seeing so everyone listening on YouTube or wherever, whatever other forums. Germany. What? Okay, there was um, some uh, other voice coming in. So so try try again if you can ask questions on on the Wolfi app. Um, thank you, Ahmed. You talk, your presentation was very long, so we can only ask one question. Sorry, yes, sorry for that. <laughs> Let's move on to As Azim is also here. Fazali Azim Khilji, is that right? From, yeah. from the arts program in, in Bonn, apparently, a fantastic yeah. program, I have to say. And he's going to talk to us about uh, an analysis of the impact of climate change on the stream flow of uh, Shastra Slai watershed in Afghanistan. I'm sure I mangled that. So, but let's let's uh, let's hear him talk about it rather than me. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Bazlezim Khilji, Primary Agriculture Sciences and Resource Management in Tropics and Subtropics at the University of Bonn, Germany. This poster is about to analyze the impact of climate change and the stream flow at Chagasraya watershed in Afghanistan. Chagasraya watershed is a part of Kunar Subbasin, which is situated in the eastern region of Afghanistan. In this study, we use SWAT model soil and water assessment tool in order to evaluate the impact of climate change on the river hydrology of Chagasraya watershed. 
The performance of the SWOT model was evaluated by using NSE and R square. The future climate change scenario per this study were extracted from the South Asian domain of Codex. The input data for the SWOT model was temperature, precipitation, wind speed, solar radiation, relative humidity, digital evaluation model, land use, and soil map. The output of the SWOT model was simulated stream flow. This simulated stream flow and observed stream flow were calibrated and validated with the SWOT cup. The figure number three in this slide is showing the results of calibration and validation of the SWOT model. These graphs show that there is a small difference between simulated stream flow and observed stream flow, which shows a strong predictive capability of the SWOT model for both calibration and validation. Figure number four in this slide is showing the mean annual temperature and precipitation under RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 at the Jagas Ray Watershed for the period of 2014 to 2030. This graph shows that there is a large increase in the temperature, but there is a very small increase in the precipitation under both scenario as compared to the previous data. Figure number five is showing the mean monthly stream flow under RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 at the Chakasray watershed. This graph shows that the overall stream flow is expected to be decreased due to the high increase in temperature, which triggers the rate of evapotranspiration during the study period. From these results, we concluded that the SWAT model simulation had a good performance to predict the stream flow with the monthly time steps in a mountainous watershed. We also concluded from these results that the increasing trend of temperature could negatively affect the water availability in the watershed, especially during the peak demand period. This study provides a base for the estimation of the water availability in the watershed, but for future studies are required to consider the water demand side. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. I'm also looking forward to everyone's questions. Um, not seeing any on the chat yet. Everyone's probably still vigorously typing. Do we have any questions in the room? Not seeing any. Um, well, I have a question. So in, in terms of, I mean, SWOT models always need, need a, a lot of input data. Yeah? I mean, uh, the climate and stuff, yeah, we can get climate scenarios, but how about land, land cover, soil maps and stuff? And it seems in, I'm not gonna try again, that, that watershed in Afghanistan, uh, do you have, confidence that the data you found is really representative of, of what's going on? The, the data we got, it was uh, some data from APO, some was from Agromet, which was uh, recently they have started some projects uh, uh, from 2000, 2000, and they have installed some uh, meteorological stations and hydrological st uh, stations. So we got the data and then there were some other uh, station which we compared the data because uh, uh, there were a lot of missing, there were a lot of gaps in the data, but after comparing these data, and then we did some uh, bias corrections. Uh, mm -hmm. And after that, we realized we compared with the previous uh, data. So finally, we, we uh, filtered those data and uh, it was somehow like, 90 percent was the data was uh, accurate because there was no any other data available so we struggled very hard to to uh, to manage the data and finally we succeeded we compared the results so almost it was like what was i was observing uh, in the area because i worked there in some projects and, and i collected those data and then later we we when i simulated the model so almost it was like 95 person was okay. The data was fine, with, which, which was presenting the current situation or. Sounds good. Um, current so about the, the land use, the, about the land use. So we uh, 
Fazlullah Akhtar, who has did the Good land morning use. And welcome uh, to our poster presentation at a slightly different Tobenta conference 2000. Okay, thank you for that input. <laughs> that, mean, that means we have to talk, stop talking about land use and we have to talk about something else. Yeah, so I was talking about the land use. Uh, we, we didn't do land use because we use all the land for the seventh year or eight year he did it, uh, Fazlullah did it. And so at the same uh, time period, so I was using, I was doing the data analysis. So already the MEF did it, so we use the same MEF for, that there was no any big difference in the land use. Okay. Yeah, the land use. Sounds good. I have another question here that actually came through on the chat. So guys, it is possible. Please, please uh, get more active there. So the question is, thank you for the presentation, which is another question, but it's, uh, thank, thank you anyway. Uh, I would be interested in the consequences of the decrease for agriculture. Will, you, will this affect irrigation or other yeah. factors? This comes from Ann-Kathrin Rosenbaum on the chat. Yeah, it's definitely decreasing the, the, the irrigation because it shows this uh, simulation is so showing the availability of water and runoff. So uh, like decreasing, we, we consider also the, the, the agriculture side while decreasing the water, we considering the whole hydrology of the, uh, of the uh, watershed. So it's definitely decreasing uh, the agriculture uh, as, uh, with, the, with the decreasing of water in the watershed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it's uh, around 20% of decreasing our water in the, in the coming uh, 30 years. So uh, definitely it would decrease the, uh, the agriculture in the area. Okay, so that's a serious uh, cause for concern and you're on the forefront of finding out what's going to happen. So thanks, thanks for, for this presentation. Very nice. And we move on to uh, Isabel Karst now. who's going to talk, us about, uh, talk to us about remotely sensed yield modeling of household fields to monitor child undernutrition and climate change impacts. So let's get started on this presentation. Good morning and welcome to our poster presentation at a slightly different Open Tech Conference 2020. No matter where you are, we hope you are well. I am Isabel Kars from the Remote Sensing Solutions game behind Munich, and I'm presenting our results for the name of Isabel Monk from the University of Heidelberg and our entire international research team that we collaborated with. In our project, we looked at the potential of remote sensing data to model yields of individual household fields. Yield quantification is especially crucial in the context of subsistence farming and undernourishment of children. Our main research questions were, first of all, can remote sensing, in our case Sentinel-2, be used to model yields at household scale? And secondly, how reliable are yield predictions to counter food insecurity and child undernutrition? Our study area is based in the Nuna HDSS in rural Burkina Faso in West Africa. It is dominated by small-scale subsistence farmers that mainly rely on rain-fed farming of very small fields. The area is highly affected by climate change and consequential climate extremes. The figure shows the increased rainfall variability, and based on these, farmers face changing crop calendars, yield loss, and food insecurity. As a result, undernutrition of children is high. Our methodology is based on field data and the remote sensing time series from the Sentinel-2 satellites. While the field data is comprised of household points, field outlines, and yield measurements, we calculated different vegetation indices for the time series. With the time series and yield measurements, we created a multiple linear regression model, which then again was applied to our field outlines to model yield for five different crop types. By spatially combining this model to our household points, we linked yield predictions to households for the first time. The map shows an excerpt of our study area, which shows yield predictions per field. Interestingly, we can see that there are variations of the yield amounts within a field, but also between two different fields and also crop types. In conclusion, we identified multiple influential factors on our model reliability. 
In terms of field measurements, this could be pests or the weather that influence the drying of the yield, but also the methodology chosen. For the remote sensing data, these could be trees or bushes on the fields itself, which then again influence the reflected signal, or also cloud coverage found in the images. For future adaptations and applications, we suggest including additional model parameters, such as weather or field management variables, but also soil data. A multi-annual application of the model would allow the evaluation of the impact, for example, of climate change, agricultural interventions, or farming practices on the yield itself. To conclude and complete the circle of our research questions, yes, remote sensing can quantify and predict crop yields at 10 meter spatial resolution. And the model allows yield forecasts up to two months before harvest, enabling the implementation of political measures to counteract undernourishment of children. I thank you very much for your time and your attention. I look forward to your questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I was just told we have to speed up a bit, but I have one short question here, a very short, truncated question somewhat, um, from the internet, uh, from the uh, chat by uh, Juliana Dow. Julian Dow, um, did you also take the economic? So did you also collect economic data? I believe that means. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. I mean, we did a, lot, a very extensive household survey. So we did go to the individual families and um, it was more on the level of the child health. So we also had a nutritional um, survey that we conducted. Um, the entire area is very rural. So there is the economic- Hello everyone, is this is who- um, poor, let's say. So they're not, uh, there's not a big difference between the different households that we visited. There are a few households that have um, the option to use fertilizer, but they were so few that that probably did not have a large in, uh, influence on the results. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Can't check back with a questioner. Okay, so I'm going to refrain from asking questions because I'm we're, we're a bit late, but thank you very much for this for this nice presentation. Sure, thank you. We move on to Thuong Go, who's also here uh, from Viet going back to Vietnam. So this will be about zonal and seasonal methane emissions from rice production in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. Bo, a PhD student at Uni Hohenheim. Today I'm going to present our research, zonal and seasonal methane emissions from rice production in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. As you know, Vietnam is one of the world's biggest rice producers, and the Mekong River Delta is popularly known as the Rice Bowl of Vietnam, which accounts for more than 50% of the country's rice production. However, Rice production is a significant source of greenhouse gas methane. But the amount of methane emissions strongly varies between locations and seasons within the Mekong Delta. Rice in the Mekong Delta is produced in three different zones, saline zones, alluvial acid surface, and flooded zones. And in three different seasons, we have early year, mid-year, and late year seasons, jointly with the periods of salinity and deflood risk in Figure 1C, as you can see here at the middle. And in Vietnam, at a national scale, methane emissions are estimated based on the IBCC guidelines, which provide the default emission factor at a subcontinental scale without taking into account such seasonal and zonal effects. Therefore, this study investigates the effects of seasons and zones on emission factors in the Mekong Delta. This study comprises a few measurements at 12 sites with 24 cropping seasons using the closed chamber method. After sampling, sample were stored in vials and analyzed methane concentrations using gas chromatograph. 
then the daily emission rates were derived from the slope of concentration increases and seasonal emission rates from the number of days of cultivation period. And in this study, we found that there was a very large variation in emissions across the delta. Actually, when compiling emission data from the Mekong River Delta, our working hypothesis was that the pronounced differences among hydrological zones would also be reflected in different levels of methane emissions. Uh, namely, highest emissions obtained in the flooded zone and lowest in the saline zone. Even though the individual measurements supported this assumption, but the entire available data didn't confirm the hypothesis. And we attributed this finding to two drivers. First of all, the, the avoidance of adverse seasonal effects through adjusted cropping calendars. And second, uh, the protections of rice areas from adverse seasonal effects through improved infrastructure in canals and sluices. We also found that seasonal emission factors are generally higher than the IBCC defaults for Southeast Asia, corresponding to 124 kilograms per hectare per season. However, when looking at the seasonal differences, we found that the seasonal emission rate of the two seasons Early and mid-year seasons are significantly different, whereas the late-year seasons were not included in the analysis due to the limitations of number of measurements. And in the end of the study, we conclude that methane emissions are mainly determined by cropping seasons and to a lesser extent by hydrological zones. In turn, using season-based emission factors is referable to zone-based emission factors. An emission factor of methane in the Mekong River Delta rice production are in range of 31 to 908 kilograms per hectare per season. And these data clearly show that methane emissions in the Mekong Delta rice production are well above the default value given by IBCC for Southeast Asia rice production. Then that's it. So that's the end of our presentation. And uh, thanks for your attention. We look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for this Hello, everyone. This is Hung Vo. Hello. Do we have a, a very short question and short answer? Yes, please. Is there any out there? I'm not seeing any in the chat. Um, I have a very, two small questions. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm not so, such, such an expert in the, in the part of the rice production with the methane, but I would like to know if it is well known from where specifically those emissions are coming from when they are taking the measurements. Uh, we take it from the, uh, of course, from the uh, from the soil and uh, uh, the 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 methane emission is coming out out of the soil and, and also the plants. Okay. Yeah, and then we use the close chain method. Uh, to, yeah, to capture the, I mean, to close the 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 plants and then we take it by using the syringes. Okay, and the second question, very fast. Yeah. For how long uh, was your measurement in the chambers? For the um, we took the uh, 30 minute interval at uh, every uh, 0, 10, 20, and, 50, uh, and 30 minutes. Yeah, thank you. OK, so uh, moving on quickly. Um, uh, sorry, technicians, we have, we'll have to play all of them. We can't cut people out. And we have to go over a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move. Um, for, for, for the was very slow speed of my presentation, I don't know. No, 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 no problem, no problem. I'm not, not, uh, but let, let's move on to the next one quickly. I'm not going to read the title and leave it to the speaker to do that. Dear audience, I'm delighted to welcome you together with my co-authors to this poster presentation. My name is Teresa Detering and I am a master's student at the University of Hohenheim at the 
Hans Gutenberg Institute. And today, I will present my master thesis research with the topic Methane emissions of different rice varieties, diurnal emission patterns of three development stages. This master thesis was conducted in collaboration with an existing PhD field trial in Vietnam. Currently, the atmospheric concentrations of the greenhouse gas methane, which is 28 times more potent than CO2, are rising faster than at any time in the last two decades. To combat climate change, it is essential to quantify and mitigate the main anthropogenic sources of methane, including rice production. It is important to know that siege for emissions from rice paddies show significant diurnal variations, but these are neglected when field measurements are scheduled at a fixed time of a given measuring day, leading to over or underestimation of emissions. To detect and analyze diurnal methane emission patterns of local rice varieties and to use this data to correct emission factors and furthermore allow the selection of low emitting rice varieties we conducted a field experiment in the Anjang province of the Vietnam Mekong River Delta. Methane fluxes were determined using a mandatory operated closed chamber method. CH4 samples were collected at 0, 15 and 30 minutes after chamber closure and analyzed with a gas chromatograph. Now I would like to move on to the results. You can see the three diurnal measurements illustrated as line graphs. The different colors of the lines represent the three rice varieties. We can observe that the siege for emissions of all three diurnal measurements gradually increase from the morning onwards, exhibiting the highest methane fluxes in the early afternoon between 12 and 3 p.m. Furthermore, clear diurnal emission patterns can be seen at tillering and flowering stage by methane fluxes at panicle initiation, show lower values and diurnal variations are less pronounced. If you compare the varieties with each other, it can be seen that OM576, here illustrated with the blue line, showed the least methane fluxes and lowest peak emissions at all development stages. And also when we look at the daily methane emissions and compare OM18, here seen as a red bar, with OM576 in blue. We see that the differences in daily methane emissions become more and more pronounced in later stages of development, leading us to the conclusion. We have shown that all three varieties exhibit distinct diurnal patterns with peak emissions at the early afternoon, and that the development stage influences the characteristics of the diurnal emissions. In the following process, this data will be used to develop a correction factor for the PhD field trial to obtain a daily representative CH4 flux value, which is necessary to accurately estimate the total seasonal emissions. Moreover, we have shown that the daily methane emission varies strongly between varieties. These varietal effects combined with appropriate water and feed management represent one of the most promising strategies for methane mitigation and will be verified in further experiments. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and enjoy talking time. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Theresa told me in the morning that she can't make it for, for personal reasons, so we can't ask her questions and we can um, I thank her anyway for the video in case she's watching from somewhere. Um, and uh, we'll move on over to Mariko directly, to Oman. Welcome to the short introduction of our post. Poster with the title Gaseous Nitrogen and Carbon Losses During Sun Drying of Goat Manure, Effects of Drying Conditions and Feed Additives. Animal manure is an important resource in many agricultural systems. However, improper conservation and storage can lead to considerable carbon and nitrogen losses. Charcoal and tannins used as feed additives can stabilize organic matter and nitrogen in manure due to their properties. Our research question was therefore, can feed additives, activated charcoal or tannins, 
reduce gases, nitrogen and carbon losses from manure during drying and storage. To this end, we conducted three experiments in Sohar, Oman, to measure ammonia, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide emissions from drying manure at different manure quantities and climatic conditions. The manure was collected from male goats of a local breed fed a basal diet, without feed additives or with 2.5% activated charcoal or 3.6% capracitanin extract. Here you can see the major differing manure properties. Gas emissions were measured using a photoacoustic multi-gas analyzer connected to closed chamber which you can see in the picture on the right side. In this slide you can see the average emission rates of ammonia, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide during drying in the striped columns where dry matter content was below 90% and after reaching constant weight at about more than 90% dry matter, representing the conditions in which manure is usually stored. In experiment 1, constant weight was reached within 4 hours due to very hot temperatures and a small quantity of manure per square meter. Under these conditions, ammonia emission rates were very high in all treatments, while CO2 emission rates were comparably low. In experiment 2 and 3, constant weight was reached after more than 80 hours due to higher manure quantity per square meter. Ammonia volatilization was much lower under slow drying conditions compared with the quick drying conditions in experiment 1. Even after reaching constant weight, though on a much lower level, ammonia volatilization from quickly dried manure was considerable, which is of relevance when manure is stored for longer periods. Slow drying manure had almost no emissions in dry condition. In contrast, CO2 emissions were higher under slow drying conditions, indicating higher microbial activity over a prolonged period. This coincides with the low ammonia emissions, indicating an immobilization of nitrogen by microorganisms. This table shows the cumulative nitrogen and carbon emissions during manure drying. About 0.5 to 1.4% of initial nitrogen content in manure was lost via gas emissions. Cumulative carbon emissions in experiment 2 and 3 accounted for about 2% loss of initial carbon in manure. While activated charcoal did not show consistent effects on cumulative nitrogen and carbon losses, capracotannin significantly reduced nitrogen and carbon losses. From our results, we conclude that only minor amounts of carbon and nitrogen were lost during sun drying of manure. Slow drying conditions favor microbial activity, increasing carbon losses, but reducing ammonia volatilization by microbial immobilization, which is also favorable for manure storage. Feeding of cabrachotannins could reduce both carbon and nitrogen losses by up to 64%, and is a promising feed additive to improve particularly nitrogen cycling in livestock crop systems. All right, thank you. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to <laughs> allow any more questions because we, I'm, a, I'm a terrible time manager, as you may already have noticed. We had, I think, um, so, but, so thank you anyway for this uh, nice excursion to Oman. Uh, where I did my PhD in kind of related projects. So this always, uh, whatever, strikes a chord with me. Um, thanks everybody for this exciting session. I think uh, we went a bit over time, but I, I hope it was all worth it. We had well over 30 um, listeners or watchers on, on YouTube, which is fantastic. So we're all YouTubers now. Congratulations, guys. Um, thanks, thanks for everyone's contributions. I think it was really exciting. And um, well, I wish you a lovely conference and I hope to see you again, possibly in the afternoon when we have the um, oral, the slightly longer oral presentations at three o'clock on climate change adaptation and mitigation. Thanks a lot and enjoy Tropentar 2020. Bye-bye. <laughs>